Adelante. Buenos días a todas y a todos. Good morning, everyone. Eh, soy Gabriela Hipólito Donnell de la Universidad Nacional de San Martín en Argentina. Les doy una muy cordial bienvenida a una nueva edición del premio y conferencia Laza Guillermo Donnell, Contribuciones a la Democracia, de Guillermo O'Donnell Democracy Award and Lectureship. Este premio fue establecido en 2017 para honrar la distinguida carrera y el liderazgo intelectual innovador del politólogo argentino Guillermo Donnell, quien como ustedes saben dedicara más de cuatro décadas al estudio sobre el autoritarismo, los avatares de la democracia y la democratización. Guillermo también fue un actor fundamental para la construcción institucional de las ciencias sociales en la región y un activista de la democracia como forma de vida. El objetivo del premio, por lo tanto, es reconocer trabajo académico excepcional en el campo de los estudios sobre la democracia, o servicio público particularmente meritorio en la promoción de la democracia y los valores democráticos en América Latina y el Caribe. Ganadores del premio en ediciones anteriores incluyen Sergio Vitar, Robert Kaufman, Evelyn Huber y John Stephens, José Waldenberg y Susan Stokes. Sus contribuciones están disponibles en LASA Forum. Quiero agradecer a LASA por la oportunidad de establecer este premio, en especial a la directora ejecutiva Mili Pereira y al staff, por todo su apoyo para la organización del premio en todas sus etapas. Quiero agradecer a Giselle Blanco, Vanessa Chávez y Jania González. Agradecemos al comité de selección de esta edición del premio, la sexta, Evelyn Huber, Santiago Anria y Rosana Castiglione, y al co-chair del comité, Jesús Tobar. En este agradecimiento también incluimos a todos los miembros de comités anteriores que como este dedicaron tiempo y esfuerzo desinteresadamente para que el premio sea un éxito. Y así también muchísimas gracias a quienes han contribuido financieramente al endowment del premio. Un reconocimiento al presidente de LASA, Gerardo Otero, por su confianza en delegarnos la tarea de selección. Y muy especialmente a AMESIP, la Asociación Mexicana de Ciencias Políticas, que es co-sponsor del evento de hoy. A Mariana Arzate, su secretaria ejecutiva, y a su secretario general y co-chair del comité, Jesús Tobar. Es un honor que el profesor Max Cameron de la Universidad de British Columbia haya aceptado este premio. Él representa como nadie la forma de hacer ciencia política de Guillermo O'Donnell, una ciencia política rigurosa, pero con aspiraciones prácticas, comprometida con la praxis democrática y la dignidad del ser humano que esa praxis conlleva. Estoy muy feliz de poder compartir esta sesión con Max y con Jesús. Y Guillermo también lo estaría. Es lo mejor de la vida académica poder compartir estos momentos con quienes admiramos y respetamos. Luego de la conferencia del profesor Max Cameron, pueden enviar sus preguntas en todos los idiomas que son efectivos en LASA. Inglés, castellano y también portugués. Así que ahora le voy a dar la palabra a mi amigo, colega, cochear, Jesús Tobar, el secretario general de AMESIP, para que lo presente al profesor Cameron como él corresponde. Adelante, Jesús. Muchas gracias, Gabriela Hipólito Donnell. Es un placer, nos has dado la oportunidad de confitrionar este premio. Entonces, te estamos muy agradecidos. Siempre eres una colaboradora frecuente de la Asociación Mexicana de Ciencias Políticas. También a LASA por tener una amplia disponibilidad para que podamos, podamos en este caso, la Asociación Mexicana de Ciencia Política coparticipar. Eh, estamos muy honrados. Los asociados de la Asociación Mexicana de Ciencias Políticas son frecuentes participantes, ponentes en los diversos congresos de LASA. Eh, como, como el que se está llevando este año. Y por último, eh, en los agradecimientos, pues estoy muy honrado de haber participado, eh, de haber eh, visto las candidaturas, de haber dado mis opiniones y finalmente de una elección que podríamos decir sabia, 
¿eh? más por mis colegas que por mí mismo. Ha sido una gran decisión, eh, dado pues que es difícil entre diversos colegas de amplia trayectoria. Eh, por otro lado, eh, nosotros los latinoamericanos eh, tenemos pues una, una herencia que procuramos seguir de las enseñanzas de la teoría de, los, de la amplia bibliografía de Guillermo O'Donnell. Tuvimos algunos de nosotros la suerte de compartir con él, otros más suerte aún de ser sus alumnos o colegas. Y dentro de este marco de seguir la pauta de trabajo de investigación de teoría que nos deja Guillermo O'Donnell, hay algunas personas que continúan creativamente este trabajo. Eh, y en este marco de colegas que siguen esta trayectoria, eh, uno de ellos pues es eh, eh, Max Cameron. Eh, por eso estamos muy contentos en que podamos eh, compartir eh, eh, con Laza, eh, con Gabriela O'Donnell, esta, este justo premio a nuestro amigo y colega eh, Maxwell Cameron. Max es también un frecuente colaborador de Asociación Mexicana de Ciencias Políticas. Así es que las redes, como dicen, el mundo es un pañuelo, las redes eh, académicas, la, la, las influencias, los, los marcos teóricos en, en torno a Guillermo Donnell nos vinculan en esta ocasión. Eh, paso a, a, a dar una a reseña eh, de, de nuestro premiado, eh, el profesor Maxwell Cameron quien es profesor del Departamento de Ciencia Política y de Escuela de Política Pública y Asuntos Internacionales de la Universidad de British Columbia, donde también es director del Centro para los Estudios de las Instituciones Democráticas. Antes de estar en la Universidad de British Columbia, ha enseñado en la Universidad Carleton en Ottawa y es doctor en, política, en Ciencia Política por la Universidad de California, Berkeley. A través de su carrera académica, el profesor Cameron ha ostentado muchas um, visitas um, prestigiosas como en la Universidad de Yale, en el Colegio de México, en el Centro de los Estudios Mexicanos Norteamericanos en la Universidad de California, en San Diego, en el Instituto Kellogg, eh, en el Instituto Peter Wall para Estudios Avanzados. Eh, y recientemente, en el 2020, fue nominado visitante distinguido en la Asociación Canadiense de Estudios Latinoamericanos y Caribeños. Entre sus numerosas publicaciones, voy a mencionar las más recientes, te, eh, tenemos a Democracia y Auto, eh, perdón, eh, Constituciones Fuertes, voy a mencionarlos en sus títulos en inglés como corresponde y las publicaciones en castellano. Eh, Strong Constitutions de la Oxford University Press 2013, eh, Political Institutions and Practical Wisdom, Oxford University Press 2018, eh, New Institutions for Participatory Democracy in Latin America eh, 2012, y bueno, pues está ahí eh, en prensa, eh, como decimos en castellano en el horno, el, el, el libro de eh, Challenge to Democracy in the Andes, Strong Men, Bro Broken Constitutions and Regimes in, Cri in Crisis. Eh, próximo a salir este, este año, esperemos tener pronto este libro. Eh, también eh, eh, Max ha contribuido no solo desde la academia, sino desde la promoción de la democracia en el Centro para los Estudios eh, de las Instituciones Democráticas. Eh, ha sido profesor, cofundador del Instituto para Legisladores eh, Futuros, un programa que prepara aspirantes a congresistas para el servicio público. Eh, también ha sido asesor político de la OEA en, la, en elecciones, en observación de elecciones en Perú y ha fundado la red de investigación de la democracia andina. Eh, eh, Max es un comentador frecuente eh, en, eh, sobre política en los medios y también a, es um, consejero para um, la elaboración de políticas públicas en temas como reforma electoral, compromiso ciudadano, eh, representación proporcional, eh, innovación en participación y defensa de la democracia en América Latina. Eh, bueno, entonces esta es una pequeña reseña, nos demoraríamos mucho más tiempo en completar toda la larga trayectoria de Max. Enhorabuena Max y te esperamos en México, tú sabes.
Muchas gracias, Jesús. Muchas gracias por eh, tan generosa introducción. Y gracias a Gabriela, en particular, por decir que Guillermo hubiera, hubiera sentido feliz por ese premio. Porque la verdad es que cuando me contaste que había ganado ese premio, lo primero que sentí era cierta tristeza. Eh, sentí la ausencia de, de Guillermo, que, que ha sido tan importante para todos. Y yo hubiera gustado si él hubiera conocido ese premio. Que, así que muchas gracias a, a, a ustedes. Muchas gracias en particular al, al comité, eh, eh, que sin yo saberlo me, me nombraron y uh, con la sorpresa de que eh, me eligieron para ese, ese premio. Estoy sumamente agradecido. Eh, voy a hablar en inglés. Uh, uh, the title of, of my talk today is uh, O'Donnell's Parable, uh, which I'll explain in just a minute. But first, I want to acknowledge that I speak uh, from the traditional, uh, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, uh, including the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. The dispossession of indigenous peoples is ongoing throughout the Americas. And as a settler, I acknowledge the damage inflicted by colonialism and the need for reconciliation. <clears throat> this can only occur, I believe, within the framework of a strong constitutional democracy. And this war award has special meaning for me because uh, I can fix the date that I became a political scientist to the moment when as an undergraduate, I first read modernization and bureaucratic authoritarianism. And from that day forward, as uh, Luis Tonelli once said, I didn't just want to be like O'Donnell. I wanted to be O'Donnell. David Collier had edited the new authoritarianism in Latin America, which was a whole discussion of O'Donnell's work. And that led me to Berkeley, where I was fortunate as a graduate student to enjoy the company of an extraordinary cohort of students working under David's mentorship. I returned to Canada to teach at Carleton University and took a detour into the NAFTA debate. And so it wasn't until around 1996, 97, during a fellowship at the Kellogg Institute at the University of Notre Dame, that I finally had the chance to meet Guillermo. And I attended his seminar on democratic theory. And that set me on the path to today's talk. I found Guillermo full of surprises. I remember, for example, him complaining that institutionalism had gone too far in political science. And here was someone who more than anyone else had shaped my thinking about institutions. And he was saying we'd gone too far. He was interested in democratic theory. And as a student of Max Weber, he insisted it had to be realistic and sociologically grounded. I liked that. He had just written a brilliant critique of theories of democratic consolidation, which suggested that the existing literature was teleological. That was a surprise because I assumed Guillermo would be a major contributor to that literature. He taught us to think of democracy, liberalism, and republicanism as three distinct traditions, often mutually reinforcing, but sometimes in tension. Liberalism in particular, he argued, was counterintuitive outside the established democracies of the Northwest quadrant of the world. One of the most vivid lessons that Guillermo taught us came in the form of a parable. And I'd like to use this parable to think about the ways in which our understanding of democracy has evolved since the transitions in the 1980s through to the debates on consolidation and delegative democracy in the 1990s, to, to Latin America's left turns starting roughly around the year 2000 into the early 2010s, and finally to our current moment of polarization and democratic dysfunction. <clears throat> 
I hasten to add that I don't claim that O'Donnell would agree with anything that I'm about to say, and I regret that he's not here to subject my arguments to his penetrating criticisms. Instead, I draw on a forthcoming book that Jesus just mentioned called Challenges to Democracy in the Andes, Strong Men, Broken Constitutions, and Regimes in Crisis. I've edited, edited this book with Grace Jaramillo and a terrific group of collaborators, and Lynn Reiner is publishing it a little bit later this year. So let me begin with O'Donnell's parable. He asked us to imagine two cities. And I know that uh, Guillermo and Gabriella loved traveling in Italy. And I imagine he had in mind places like Florence or perhaps Siena with its fresco, the allegory of good and bad government in the Palazzo Publico. And he asked us to imagine there's a kind of Hobbesian war of all against all going on in one of the cities, a war probably caused by tensions between the rich and the poor. And after years of suffering and destruction, the citizens come together and agree to stop killing each other. Guillermo called this a mediocre agreement, but he didn't mean by that to imply that it was unimportant because once the agreement was reached, the denizens of the city returned to their daily lives and then something marvelous happened. Agriculture grew, commerce expanded, the arts and cultures thrived, political associations multiplied. In short, the city flourished. And seeing this, the second city decided to adopt the institutions of the first. Now, the question that Guillermo asked the class was, would the result be the same? Would the second city flourish just like the first? This is an important question. And as a master teacher, Guillermo didn't directly answer it, but he left it to us to think it through. Perhaps one answer comes from a certain kind of liberal institutionalism. I'm really thinking here of the work of someone like Francis Fukuyama. In this view, institutions confer benefits on societies, and societies compete with one another to capture these benefits by importing better institutions. Some societies win out over others. In this view, the winners are typically the West, whose institutions confer benefits unattainable to societies organized on the basis of non-Western habits and customs. Despite withering critiques of modernization theory, not least by O'Donnell, much credence was given to this Eurocentric view by the end of the Cold War. The West had won. It was, according to the hubris of the time, the shining city on the hill for all others to emulate. Guillermo gave us another way of thinking about this problem. He argued that democracy was based on what he called an institutionalized wager. The wager was that every ego agrees to respect the rights and freedoms of every altar in return for every altar respecting egos, rights, and freedoms. And this is institutionalized in the sense that the rights and freedoms entailed by the wager are legally binding. And I would add that the specific content would need to be worked out in the practice of politics. Legal institutions alone, unless they're enacted in everyday practices, may be insufficient to uphold the wager, whether the city is originating or imitating. The agreement needs to be based on the hard fought struggle, the reluctant acceptance, and the legal institutionalization of the wager. In this view, the second city would not necessarily replicate the results of the first for three reasons. One reason is that the second city would not have the same experience. Their citizens didn't reach the agreement on their own. They would not necessarily have tried and failed and tried again and through this process learned to trust themselves and each other. Another reason is that the second city would be seeking the benefits of the mediocre agreement, but those benefits were actually a side effect of the process of learning to live together without killing each other in the originating city. 
It's one thing to create institutions to solve a problem and another to seek the benefits that flow from such solutions. Third, institutions like fine wines, as Guillermo reminded us, cannot so easily be exported from one place to another. And when they are, they often function differently. Institutions are not merely abstract rules. They're given meaning by their embeddedness in the formal and informal practices that constitute a form of life. Now, O'Donnell's parable is not a model. Every democracy is a mix of original and imitative institutions. The key takeaway is that the quality of democracy depends less on the choice of the abstractly best institutions and more on how these institutions emerge from the political struggle for democracy and whether through that process citizens learn to live together in all of their diversity and pluralism. Keeping in mind these two ways of reading O'Donnell's parable, let's now consider the literature on democratic transitions. The horrific crimes of Latin America's military regimes in the 1960s and 1970s gave rise to a painful revalorization of democracy. The facile dismissal of liberal democracy as bourgeois or merely formal gave way to an appreciation for democracy as the essential foundation of human rights and the possibility of a decent civil society. An eloquent example is given by Sergio Bitar, the first speaker in this lectureship and a former Allende government official. His reappraisal of democracy as he recounted it to me came during his imprisonment in a camp following the Pinochet coup. For the generation that negotiated transitions from authoritarian rule, democracy meant civilian rule with elections, plus human rights and political freedoms that are necessary for elections to be meaningful. O'Donnell favored Dahl's term, polyarchy. And polyarchy contains two distinct elements. There are the electoral components, which are fair and institutionalized elections, the right to vote, to run for office, and to serve at one's term. And then there are the surrounding rights and freedoms. And these include, for example, the rights of assembly, of association, freedom of speech, and the, and the press. These surrounding rights and freedoms are necessary for elections to serve as meaningful expressions of the will of the people. Polyarchy was an explicitly political regime. It didn't imply the achievement of social or economic equality. That remained on the horizon as a future possibility. Indeed, the transitions were often based on conservative pacts that both limited the ability to challenge property rights and provided a measure of impunity to the military. Not everyone was included in the pact. In the political judgment of the most relevant political actors, such compromises and exclusions were, however, necessary. Now, by the time most of the transitions from authoritarian rule were complete, Latin America had adopted willingly or reluctantly the neoliberal model of development. The simultaneity of transitions to markets and democracy, combined with the fall of the Berlin Wall, produced triumphalism and hubris among some observers who believed that liberal democracy could solve all of history's problems. In this view, Latin America's transitions represented a decisive victory for liberalism. Such hubris was punctured immediately, however, by the appearance of what O'Donnell called a new monster, namely delegative democracy. This was electoral democracy without checks and balances, where the ruler having won a popular majority would govern as they saw fit, unencumbered by constitutional niceties like the uh, existence of an independent judiciary. This type of democracy was more majoritarian than it was liberal or Republican. It wasn't modeled on the democracies um, of the originating countries and didn't conform to the theories of democracy produced by political scientists in those countries. In this context, O'Donnell issued his magnificent broadside against the consolidation literature, a literature that the transitions volumes had seemed to be teeing up. And this led to the second major debate on democracy in Latin America. O'Donnell insisted that Latin American democracies were not 
immature versions of established democracies. We shouldn't hold up established democracies or some abstraction or, or idealization of them as the standard against which to assess all democratizing nations. We shouldn't see the absence of certain attributes in new democracies as evidence that they're progressing toward, but just have not fully achieved consolidation. Rather, we should recognize the diversity of democratic regimes, the variation in the quality of democracy, which depends on issues not yet well theorized in democratic theory in the originating countries. And this is what led to O'Donnell's work on horizontal accountability. He has stressed the importance of institutions that can and will hold themselves accountable. It led to his critique of Schumpeterian or minimalist electoral democracy, which he argued neglected the state and legal conditions necessary for elites to compete for the people's votes. In this second major debate, O'Donnell's work helped foreground aspects of the legal system in the state important to democracy. The rule of law and horizontal accountability were necessary conditions for the functioning of any democratic regime. It was precisely these elements of the political system that were missing in Peru, which enabled President Alberto Fujimori to close Congress, suspend the constitution and rule by decree with broad popular support in 1992. As a close observer of proving politics at the time, it became clear to me that democracy could be destroyed not only by coups, but also by the undemocratic behavior of democratically elected politicians. Liberal institutionalists framed the problem as the rise of illiberal democracy and suggested that perhaps democracy was less important than liberalism. But in Latin America and elsewhere, liberalism has often been aligned with authoritarianism. We need to democratize liberalism rather than promote liberalism at the expense of democracy. Just as we began to understand these issues, the terms of the debate shifted once again. Latin America's left turns beginning with a wave of popular mobilizations and culminating in a pink tide of electoral victories for the left produced a revolution in participation, which included attempts at refounding Republican institutions by means of constituent assemblies. We move beyond an appreciation of the delegative nature of rule as one subtype of democracy to the realization that the democracies that had emerged in the pacted transitions of the 1980s were too exclusionary, insufficiently participatory, and in many respects, colonial, patriarchal, and racist. Without robust mechanisms of representation, many new democracies retained oligarchical features. Clearly, the mediocre bargain needed to be updated. A familiar slogan of this period called for democracy itself to be democratized. At the same time, the Bolivarian revolutions exposed the risks associated with the kind of concentration of executive power that can occur when Caesarist Democrats or demagogues seek to undermine the separation of powers and perpetuate themselves in office. Bolivarian movements fill the void created by the collapse of formal or informal systems of elite pacts, but their greatest weakness lay in their failure to recognize the crucial importance of loyal opposition in any constitutional arrangement. They brought about inclusion, but often at the expense of democracies surrounding rights and freedoms. Again, from the vantage point of liberal institutionalism, Latin America's left terms seem like a return to the bad old days of populism and authoritarianism. Some scholars argued that these left terms were fine, provided the left was social democratic and market friendly, but the bad left was authoritarian and statist. Others argued that certain outsider populists were responsible for the rise of a new post-Cold War type of hybrid regime, namely competitive authoritarianism. Both of these liter literatures offered important insights. For example, Jorge Castaneda noted that it was precisely the old left, often the traditional communist party, that was most likely to have moderated under democracy because it had felt the weight of repression during military rule. The literature on competitive authoritarianism reminds us of the importance of a reasonably level playing field for the opposition, or quite simply the importance of opposition in any system based on the alternation of power or of public office. But if I may borrow a phrase, our focus on populism has gone too far. Leaving aside the fact 
that we lack a solid definition of populism and that the concept is now just applied indiscriminately to diverse cases. All too often the literature on populism holds up liberal democracy as the normative standard against which to assess Latin American experience. As Joe Fowraker and I have argued, and in this we're echoing both Ernesto Leclau and O'Donnell, populism is almost invariably a reaction against oligarchy. The persistence of oligarchic modes of rule gives rise to populist mobilization. This doesn't prevent populists from accommodating to oligarchic modes of rule or oligarchs using populist mobilization. We know better than to expect coherence from populism. But I want us to think actually about the role of liberalism in all of this. Representative government without strong and autonomous popular sector parties and organizations is as oligarchic as it is democratic. Liberal democratic institutions have always functioned differently in Latin America, precisely because of the great inequalities and colonial legacies in the region. Liberalism means something different in Latin America. The persistence of populism tells us that Latin America continues to suffer from deep inequalities, neglect, marginalization, informalization, absence of government intervention to provide for the welfare of the public, all of course issues exacerbated by COVID-19. Is it really hard to understand why voters might reject elites and support populist outsiders in a country like Peru, where people were literally dying because the rich were hoarding oxygen for profit before and during the pandemic? The careening, to use Dan Slater's term, between populist mobilization and oligarchic modes of rule has generated intense polarization. And this brings us to the current moment in politics. Today, I believe that the debate on democracy is entering into a fourth phase. The Bolivarian movements have largely run their course. Evidence of this is that Chile is attempting to change its constitution according to procedures intended precisely to avoid the mistakes of Bolivarian constituent assemblies. A perhaps rather unlikely proposal to convene a constituent assembly in Peru would follow a similar path. Alto golpes are still possible, maybe even in the United States. Certainly the storming of the Capitol on January 6th of last year was an attempt at Alto golpe. In two cases, Venezuela and Nicaragua, authoritarianism has derailed democracy completely. But a more widespread problem is democratic dysfunction caused by social media fueled hyperpartisan polarization, disinformation, and corruption, including the corruption of common knowledge. <coughs> Indeed, I would say that the new monster that we face today is not just elected politicians who behave undemocratically, <coughs> it's politicians whether elected or not, because often they're the losers, who weaponize social media to deceive and gaslight the public in ways that politicize and weaken democratic institutions for corrupt purposes. Politicians who weaponize social media to deceive and gaslight the public in ways that politicize and weaken democratic institutions for corrupt purposes. This is a problem rooted less in institutions than in practices. To some extent, of course, polarization and politicization have always been a feature of Latin American politics. One has only to think of the late Douglas Chalmers' beautiful essay on the politicized state in Latin America or O'Donnell's essay, State and Alliances in Argentina. If we perceive the region to be more polarized today, that is in part because the Washington consensus is broken down. The period of the Washington consensus represented a sort of specious depolarization of the region. The technocratic and managerial ethos of neoliberalism suppressed polarization at the expense of politics. Today, we're living through the globalization of polarization. One of the new aspects of the current polarization is the manipulation of social media by powerful and globally networked political and economic forces. I hasten to stress that polarization is not all bad. A measure of polarization 
is healthy in a democracy. It means there are real choices, real alternatives on the table. When all parties and voters cluster around the center, politics can be sapped of energy. But the polarization that we're seeing today is in large measure due to the radicalization of the right in response to the advances of progressive politics in many countries in the region. I'm thinking of the considerable gains that have been made in terms of awareness of gender discrimination, the advancement of the rights of sexual minorities. I'm also thinking of the gains made with respect to inclusion through participatory innovations, the mobilization of indigenous peoples, and new discourses on the rights of nature or Buen Vivir. I'm thinking about opposition to extractivism, and so all of this is deeply threatening to privileged elites who are seeking to defend traditional hierarchies and power relations by attacking gender ideology or by using the fear of Chavismo to defend the status quo. Now, the defense of traditional hierarchies, the defense of the status quo, that's not a crime. The problem is that the meaning of democracy has become so contested that it becomes possible to destroy democracy in the name of democracy. A case in point is Bolivia where polarization in the years prior to the election of 2019 was driven both by the inclusion, the expansion of inclusion and the erosion of surrounding rights and freedoms, as well as violations of the constitutional order. This produced a backlash that led to the unconstitutional removal of Evo Morales from office. And while this was celebrated in some quarters as a restoration of democratic rights and freedoms, the interim government proved short-lived and repressive, which reinforces the point that the challenge is not simply to get liberal democracy back on track, but rather to find ways in which deeply divided societies can agree on democratic procedures for resolving their differences. And this is hard to do when politicians lacking a sense of responsibility stir up anti-democratic passions, undermining democracy in the name of democracy. Let me give an example of just one such demagogue. Consider the Andean Trumpism, to use a phrase of Caesar Hildebrandt, the Andean Trumpism of Peruvian presidential candidate Keiko Fujimori, who narrowly lost the presidential runoff election uh, in June 2021 to Pedro Castillo. She claimed baselessly that the election was stolen. Now you might say, newsflash, politician caught lying, but she was doing more than lying. She was gaslighting. She led a well-funded and organized effort to overturn an election based on the false claim that the election had already been overturned. She mobilized an army of lawyers to challenge systematic fraud, demanding the annulment of hundreds of thousands of votes. Her claim was that there was an international leftist conspiracy to deny her election. And the evidence she produced was that she had lost by wide margins in the poorer rural areas of Peru, while she won, of course, by wide margins in Lima. Peru's electoral authorities conducted a normal election, and neither local tribunals nor international observers found evidence of systematic fraud. And yet it cannot be said that Peru has institutionalized elections, because elections are no longer decisive. When elections are decisive, when the votes are counted, the campaigning stops. Fujimori refused to accept her loss. Instead, she used baseless, baseless allegations of wrongdoing to build a political movement in the streets, in the armed forces, and in the media, positioning herself as a bulwark against a geopolitical plot by international communism. And 85% of her supporters, 65% of the country at large, came to believe that there were signs of fraud in the election. Fujimori's behavior was not criminal, but the fact that it was widely supported by her political base and powerful allies in major institutions tells us either that some voters were ignorant and misguided, or they were prepared to deny the right to vote to other voters or both. The effort to deny votes was a kind of attempt to deny reality. I use the term denial in this context much in the same, same way as one might talk about climate denial or COVID denial or science denial. It's an affront to the institutionalized wager. It did more than expose the deep divisions in Peruvian society, which we already knew about, divisions based on class, ethnicity, and geography. 
More importantly, it exposed a racist unwillingness to accept the legitimacy of an electoral majority based on votes from the South and Central Highlands, just as Trump had challenged votes in Atlanta, Detroit, and Philadelphia. And these same people who wanted to overturn a legitimate election now bitterly opposed the idea of a constituent assembly because it would violate the constitution. So it's not that there are different knowledges and cultures at work here. The difference is between knowledge and deception, culture and corruption. It's the function of institutions to enable citizens to distinguish between common knowledge and fake news. Without this distinction, neither our freedoms nor our obligations are even intelligible. But the institutions that create common knowledge have been assaulted with the aim of delegitimating them for corrupt purposes. In Peru, as in the US, institutions survived, but just barely. And not before damage was done to the electoral authorities, not before officials were subjected to threats and intimidation, not before the politicization of the armed forces, the proliferation of hate speech, attacks on indigenous people, and above all, not before a great shadow of doubt was cast over the electoral legitimacy of the winner. In short, the threat to democracy today comes not just from coups, self-coups, or presidential aggrandizement. And it's less a consequence of institutional design than it is of political practices. It comes from demagogues who undermine the institutionalized wager for corrupt purposes. Let me end by returning to O'Donnell's parable. I've been contrasting two pictures of democratization in Latin America over the past several decades. In one, Latin America adopted the liberal democratic institutions of the West, which are the best, if not the only form that contemporary democracy can take. In this view, the persistence of populist authoritarians in preventing these institutions from functioning properly is causing backsliding, autocratization, and contributing to a global democratic recession. Obviously, aspects of this picture are accurate, but I believe it's excessively pessimistic and misdirects our attention from deeper problems. An alternative view, which I find both more hopeful and realistic, is the Latin American transitions to democracy in general, in general marked a critical step toward O'Donnell's mediocre bargain. But the specific content of the institutions that would emerge was always contingent. The hope was that a strong agreement on the importance of electoral components of the regime would anchor the surrounding rights and freedoms necessary for elections to be meaningful. On this point, the jury is still out. Decades of democratic ru rule have allowed for significant progress toward more inclusive regimes and the expansion of citizenship. In some cases, it's precisely deeper processes of social democratization that have caused the unraveling of exclusionary pacts. This can contribute to undermining democracy as in Venezuela. It can generate the kind of backlash and polarization that's occurred in countries like Peru, Bolivia, and Brazil. While on balance, the region is more democratic today than in the past, democratic deepening has intensified divisions that now threaten the core electoral practices of democracy. I believe that O'Donnell's vision of a citizen's democracy, that flourishing city, remains the most promising prospect on our horizon in Latin America and globally. But the history of democracy shatters any illusion of linear, progressive, institutional change or convergence. Democracy is always a struggle. As Weber put it, a strong and slow boring of hard boards. Its gains are hard won and never fully secure. Beware of placing too much reliance on institutions and laws. They are the institutionalization of the wager, not the wager itself. One very final reflection is in order to return to the land acknowledgement that I made at the start of this talk. It's important to recognize that citizenship is always contested and exclusionary. The medieval and ancient cities that we associate with the origin of democracy excluded slaves and women. 
one could imagine another chapter in O'Donnell's parable. In this further telling of the story, the flourishing city might become so powerful and prosperous that it begins to occupy new territories. It displaces and then attracts populations from other cities. Perhaps citizens in the originating city move to other lands and bring their institutions with them. That indeed is how settler colonialism works. In this further telling of the story, there would be a need for reckoning with harms inflicted on non-citizens, outsiders, future generations, and nature. For those excluded and marginalized, autonomy or even exodus might be preferred to acceptance of the wager. And yet I retain the belief that deepening democracy and expanding citizenship is the best path forward if our goal is to decolonize our institutions and break out of the picture of ourselves in which we are imprisoned. But that unfortunately will have to be the topic for another talk. Thank you very much for listening and I look forward to your questions and further reflections. Gracias, Max. Gracias por esta, esta gran charla. Thank you so much. We have uh, some questions and I can see here. Well, I have some comments, but we can give the floor first um, the opportunity to make uh, questions to you and then we can open for a more um, lively discussion. So I can see here there is a question by Kevin Middlebrook. I don't know if Kevin, would you like to come up on the screen and just uh, ask the question to Max and I can give you the chance to open your microphone. Okay, let me see here. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Well, first of all, Max, my most hearty congratulations uh, for the award and for your really eloquent uh, lecture. I especially appreciated that you spoke personally about Guillermo uh, in the course of time, uh, because this prize will continue at Lhasa. In the course of time, some members of the audience may not have met or interacted or really worked personally with Guillermo. And I think the, the lessons and the, and the memories that you share are very, very important in, in really helping us uh, retain and, and preserve his memory and the many, many contributions uh, that he made really in a in most pioneering way. I mean, I, I actually was privileged to uh, sit in the audience when Guillermo in, uh, I think, the second transitions uh, conference at the Woodrow Wilson Center was among the very first peace people to talk about the left's revaloration of liberal democracy as a basis of the experience with political violence in the 1960s and 1970s. And for that reason, it's always seemed to me very ironic that parts of the Latin American left, not all by certainly means, but parts have been quite frivolous uh, in their approach to the rules of liberal democracy. And in the interests of, as you said, uh, pursuing social democratization have set aside a political democracy. Uh, why, why do you think that has happened? Thank you, Kevin. And first of all, let me say thanks to you for everything you have done to make this award possible. I know you worked tirelessly to, to, um, with, with Gabriela to set it up initially, and um, you have been such a great um, uh, contributor to the effort that we're, we all are making to um, uh, I think O'Donnell's legacy will always last. I think he's made such uh, uh, enduring contributions. He will always be a point of reference for our, our conversations on democracy in Latin America. But, the, but I think it's also important to push that agenda further and, uh, and to continue down the path that he, that he started us on. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's, it's really a, my gratitude to, to you for that. Um, yeah, I think that you raised such an interesting question and, and that one of the reasons why I referred to what I thought was probably the greatest um, sort of insight in, in Jorge Castaneda's article on the two lefts, which in other, in many other respects, I, I, I disagree with and have disagreed in print with, and, uh, and, and Castaneda and I have, have argued um, ab about this. Uh, but one of the things that he insisted um, was that it, it was actually 
um, the, the left that had been repressed by the military that, that came to this reckoning. So many activists on the left um, perished anonymously in prisons in horrible conditions. And, and sort of the recognition that the fate of the armed struggle that was inspired by Cuba and other revolutionary movements uh, led so many great activists to, to their death, to dead ends politically. And so it's, not, it's interesting that it's someone like Sergio Bitar, right? Uh, from Chile, a member of the, of, the, of the Allende government, who undergoes this process of rethinking, of recognizing that for him, he said he, said he had to think about what really mattered in life when he was you know, in this prison camp. And he recognized that democracy can't be taken for granted, that this was something that was really important. Um, but I think it was, it's interesting that my, my, my sense, and I've always felt this, was that that lesson was learned, particularly in those countries, where the left experienced repression under military rule and brought that experience into the process of uh, transitions to democracy. But if you think about uh, Evo Morales and Hugo Chavez and Rafael Correa, what unites them? None of them experienced that kind of, of repression. In fact, uh, you know, Venezuela was one of the countries that didn't experience uh, military rule in the 19. 60s and 70s, and Chavez himself was part of conspiratorial circles within the military. He was very upset about watching the military repressing the Caracaso, but he himself didn't experience military repression. He was put in prison by a perfectly legitimate democratic government. Uh, uh, Evo Morales, of course, experienced racism, experienced the repression of cocaleros, um, but he doesn't come out of a struggle against a harsh military dictatorship. In fact, one of the things that's interesting about Bolivian politics from a Peruvian perspective is that while there has been, um, there have been periods, important periods of, 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 of oppressive military rule, the level of violence in Bolivia never, never uh, approximated what we saw, for example, in Peru or in some of the mil other military regimes. Um, and of course, you know, Correa is, a, is an economist coming out of the, the university circles. Um, and so I think that part of what we saw with the Bolivarian movements was it was precisely um, leftist organizations that came up around um, uh, other struggles um, and that didn't, didn't have that memory of, of repression that, uh, that, that perhaps uh, meant that they were um, neither, neither socialized by a democracy that, that, that was open to them and participatory um, and, and inclusive, but nor had they had the experience of trying to survive under a military dictatorship. So I think that that's a, I, that's a really critical point. The, 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 lesson, the, the, the lesson of the so-called mediocre bargain um, was not shared by everyone, right? Not everyone had that process of revalorization happen. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. I wanna thank you again too for being so committed to this prize. So thank you, Max, for saying that too. Okay, we have several questions. Okay, let me go here. Um, you, you can send the questions in English or Spanish or Portuguese. Okay, now we have a question by uh, Shelly McConnell. I don't know, Shelly, if you want me to read the question, you wanna say the question straight to Max? Okay, no, okay. So Max, your lecture was a tour de force and let me see here, because people are sending, please send the, the questions to the question and answer section, not to the chat, because the chat is mixed up with the uh, hellos and congratulations. And so I miss the, okay, let me, let me go here. Okay, Max, your lecture was a tour de force and therefore generates many thoughts and questions since you focus on institutions internal to countries, could you mention, um, let me go, could you mention, let me see, 
Could so you that... comment on international support for democracy and whether international norms matter or simply skip across the surface of local cultures? Right. So thank you for that. And, and Shelley, uh, Shelley, um, formerly uh, uh, at the Carter Center, and, and I were involved in the process of uh, supporting the effort to um, create an inter-American democratic charter um, that came out of the Quebec City Summit in, in 2001 um, and, uh, and, and just uh, had its uh, 20th an anniversary. Um, and there's now a summit of the Americas coming up. Uh, this will connect a little bit with Harada Monk's to the question as well. A su the ninth summit of the Americas coming up and democracy is very much on the agenda. It's one of the uh, five baskets of is issues that the leaders will be looking at. And I think we've got a, a really interesting challenge here, which is that the, that the Inter-American Democratic Charter was actually negotiated and signed at a moment of relative, relatively robust consensus in the region around the importance of democracy and an understanding of what democracy was. If you look at the definition of, of democracy in the American Democratic Charter, it's a fairly broad one. It has many, many elements. Um, and it certainly includes the kinds of things that we're concerned about it, when we think about autogolpes. It, it, in fact, it was a response to the Peruvian autogolpes. So there's uh, much discussion of uh, separation of powers, the independence of the judiciary, the importance of political parties, um, freedom of the press, and so forth. And, and uh, of course, you know, at the Quebec City Summit, uh, Chavez was there. He had just been elected. Um, he was a little bit of an outsider in that group. Uh, he had some reservations about the charter, but he went along with it. And then he benefited from it because when the coup of 2002 occurred, um, the Venezuelans appealed uh, to the OAS for support. And there was a lot of support that came, particularly from Secretary General Gaviria at that time for Venezuela. Unfortunately, it was not sufficient uh, to prevent a democracy from being derailed, which as I've argued in a recent paper with Gabriel Gombata in the Canadian Journal of Latin American Studies, really accelerated in the second term of, of Chavez from 2006 uh, to 2012, uh, and, then in, and then particularly after Maduro uh, replaced Chavez. Uh, and so the charter, I think there's a broad sense in the in, in, in among those who support the democratic charter, who are part of negotiating it, and who believe it should be applied more effectively, that it has not been particularly helpful. It, it was helpful a little bit in, in Honduras, although I think it was frankly undermined in that context by countries like the United States and Canada. I think the Insulsa was right on track in terms of the way he was approaching that, that problem. And the fact that, um, that he was undermined a little bit by Canada and the United, the United States uh, led to the terrible results that we've seen uh, in Honduras since 2009. It hasn't been particularly effective in the case of Nicaragua. We've seen a very rapid and very just you know, alarming uh, deterioration of, of, of the political situation in that country and the, the charter has not been particularly helpful. But the key thing now is that the hemisphere is deeply polarized. This, this globalization of polarization that I mentioned affects the region. It's not just that there is internal, there are internal tensions within the region. It's also the case, and I think Shelley is getting at this, that the region is deeply polarized. We now have countries um, like Mexico under AMLO, which are saying, the OAS is simply an extension of the U.S. State Department, and we should we should pull out of it. Um, of course, the, the uh, Nicaragua and Venezuela want nothing to do uh, with the OAS. Cuba has been excluded for for a very long time. There's several other regional uh, alternative uh, forums that have been created, although none of them have quite the capacity to pull together all of the countries of the region, including um, the U.S. and Canada, that the OA OAS does. And so, it's going to be a really big challenge for the um, inter-American community. Uh, for those who gather in Los Angeles in June as part of the Ninth Summit, to see what can be done uh, to reinforce support for democracy. And I think that the main thing I would say in this regard is that we do need to appreciate that democracy comes in a variety of flavors, and that there's a good deal of variation in the quality of democracy, and that it's very important that we um, use international diplomacy proactively and um, positively uh, to try to support countries that are struggling with democratic issues. Rather than waiting until crises have happened, the, the regime has been derailed, there's a collapse of democracy, and then trying to, to pick up the pieces, which is extremely hard to do. And there are models for how this has worked in the past. I think, for example, the, the transition in Peru in 2000, the OAS put dialogue roundtables in place. And those dialogue roundtables at first had not a lot of significance. But then when Fujimori fled the country, and and it was revealed that the Congress was 
permeated by Montesinos corruption, it became the dialogue roundtables rather than the Congress, where people gathered together to undertake the transition to democracy. And so I think that we need something more like that. We need more long-term investment in the region, deeper dialogue, more spaces and opportunities supported by the international community to allow conversations to happen about the future of democracy uh, in, in, in countries before crises occur, rather than waiting for them to happen. And then, as I said, trying to pick up the you know, putting Humpty Dumpty back together is always harder than preventing Humpty Dumpty from falling off the wall. Thank you, Max. Uh, now we have a question by Jerry Monk. Jerry, I, I wonder if you want to come up on the screen and... Okay, let me go to... I think that... Okay, no. Uh, okay, I will read it. Max, you are a person who has worked on the hemispheric democratic regime. My you comment about how the new democratic challenges in Latin America call for a rethinking about international democracy promotion. Yeah, okay, good. I see, I see you're there, Jerry. Okay, well, he's, he's gone. Um, so, so if you wanted to elaborate on that, that I, I, would, I would welcome that. I mean, I think, uh, you know, the, the, a real challenge that we face is, is polarization. And so uh, how can the international community uh, help to address problems of, of polarization. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big challenge, but I think that the, 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 the goal is to um, uh, refuse horizons, right? If you, if you think, if I, the way I think about polarization is if you imagine, a, you imagine looking at the earth, if you look at it from the, from the North Pole or the South Pole, you're gonna get different perspectives. If you send <clears throat> satellites out around the earth, you can defuse, um, uh, you can you can fuse horizons again. The polarization is a is a kind of a defusing of horizons. It's it's seeing it's seeing the world uh, only from one perspective. So so the challenge is how do we create spaces or opportunities for people to engage in meaningful dialogue and conversation uh, where they come to understand and accept the legitimacy of the other. And of course, this is very very hard to do in the context of. Uh, the sort of social media landscape that we're operating in, right? So, so Paul, it's it's um, social media by virtue not only of uh, the um, way that the attentional economy works, but also the business model of the platforms fosters fragmentation and it fosters echo chambers um, and and bubbles where people are only talking to other like-minded people, and they can they can um, reinforce one another even in the craziest views. And we we really see an enormous amount of that happening, particularly in countries like uh, like Brazil. Uh, Brazil's got a huge problem um, with this. And, and, <clears throat> and the critical thing is, of course, that and, and why it's such a problem in Brazil, but also in the United States and some other places, it's, it's been that the, the leaders have fostered this. So the first thing to do to stop this kind of polarization is to get rid of leaders like Bolsonaro, right? I mean, as long as Bolsonaro's in, in power, this is you're going to continue to have um, uh, the the gaslighting of the public. In fact, if I could, I'll just um, go back. Uh, I'd like to like to take a, a quote from Bolsonaro uh, that's in the written version um, of, of my talk, um, in which you know uh, you, you see you see exactly what um, what gaslighting uh, means. Hang on, just a second. He's he's talking about the possibility of um, a fraudulent outcome of the election uh, in Brazil. And he says, he says that he's warning Brazilians that he could not permit the existing electoral system to remain in place and that there could not be elections that create doubts among voters, citing unproven claims of electoral fraud. In other words, Bolsonaro, like Trump, claims that there are problems with elections, that they're fraudulent, that they, they can't be trusted. And he uses that to undermine perfectly functioning electoral institutions. That's, that's the kind of gaslighting that these leaders do. So, the, so, so it's critical that these leaders not come to power. As long as they are in power, that presents a, a very substantial 
problem in terms of um, in terms of polarization. And so the international community has to try to get a handle on this. It's of course you know very difficult to do. But the kinds of things I, I think one of the things that the international community can and should do is to try to emphasize the importance of uh, of diplomacy. Right, that one of the ways in which we diffuse tensions, both domestic and international, is through diplomacy. I think there's been a tremendous underappreciation of the value of diplomacy in recent years. Many countries that could be doing much, much more to defuse tensions. I'm thinking, of course, about the situation in Russia and Ukraine. More active diplomacy, you know, the, the whole point of having weapons is to enable you to exercise effective diplomacy, not to use those weapons. You don't want to have to use those weapons. When, when conflict occurs, when conflict breaks out, that's the end of diplomacy. And I think what we need to do is to restore a bit of a culture at the international level of the value and the importance of diplomacy. And that does mean being willing to talk with adversaries. It means talking to people with who you disagree and learning how to do that. So international diplomacy, in some sense, I think represents a bit of a model for what we also need to practice at the domestic level, which is learning to have difficult conversations with people with whom we, we disagree. And of course, that's very hard in, a, in an environment in which social media is polarizing us. Jerry, do you wanna, do you wanna speak further to this? Because I think you have more to your question. Can, can you hear me? <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, so, so just um, uh, uh, bring it to some specific sort of, um, a lot of the work with the, the democratic regime in the hemisphere, is due to the work of the organization American states. Um, so, and there's a lot of debate about sort of the Inter-American Democratic Charter. Uh, has it been working? Has it not been working? How could it be made more effective? The Carter Center has played an important role in, in those kinds of discussions. Um, at the same time, you have a figure like Luis Almagro that's very polarizing for some circles within uh, Latin America. Um, so that's one center, sort of, you know, the YS and Almagro has an important leadership role. Uh, you have people like uh, Lopez Obrador that's trying to reboot CELAC, um, have a bit of an alternative to the OS. So it, grounding it in terms of these institutional options uh, that are, play a very important role, intergovernmental, civil society organizations. Uh, so sort of, you're talking about a dialogue, sort of, so perfectly sort of good uh, suggestion, but sort of grounding in terms of these actors that we have in the in the hemisphere. Um, do you have some views on some steps forward, way to go forward? Well, that's a that's a huge, huge question. And um, I have been uh, doing a little bit of work in both in, in, in my teaching with my students. Um, in my, the course I taught this year on um, the internet inter-American system. Uh, we've organized several workshops and we're, we've been looking at at what kinds of things um, could be done uh, to, to try to um, create spaces for meaningful uh, international or regional dialogue around democratic questions. I, I you know, I mean, I, I don't, I think that, you're, you know, the, one of the, something that's sort of implicit in what you're saying, the OES has lost a lot of legitimacy, right? Um, it's, it's deeply questioned now, um, as is the summit's process and has been for some time. Um, Canada played an active role with the Lima Group in trying to um, challenge the legitimacy of, of Maduro in Venezuela and has supported Guaido. But now there have been elections, both presidential and, uh, and, and parliamentary in, in Venezuela and continue to support Guaido doesn't seem to make a whole lot of, a lot of sense. So I think we've got to sort of pull back from the kind of the, the confrontations um, that were occasioned by uh, the rise of particularly the ALBA countries uh, and the way in which they um, really sought to build alternatives to the OAS. I, I would say that the OAS is still the, the premier multilateral institution in the region, and it's worth continuing to invest in it, but it's going to be important that we do so in a way that is as inclusive as possible while, while trying to insist on the, on the importance of uh, upholding fundamental democratic rights and freedoms as a condition of, of membership. So what kinds of things could be done? One of the things, one initiative that I think is important, well, for, for, for one thing is, and, and this is consistent with the whole tenor of my talk is, let's get back to basics, right? Let's really focus on making sure that we have free and fair elections. So the international community really has to, I think, make a strong push to say, we have a stake in every country holding free and fair elections. It should be a condition of uh, good standing in the international community that you're open to international observers and all countries need to be committed 
to ensuring that elections are free and fair, the electoral authorities are respected, that they're transparent, that there isn't any kind of hanky panky. And of course, we had the big, there's a whole big fight about what happened in Bol Bolivia uh, with, the, with the OAS. Um, you know, and, and, and all I'll say with respect to that is, if you go down the path of personalizing politics, of violating your own constitution and trampling on fundamental rights and freedoms, you're gonna face skepticism in the international community if you can't hold elections that seem to be genuinely uh, transparent, free and, and fair. That said, there were horrible problems with, with what happened with that OAS mission. And you know, we, we, could, we could talk about those at some length. I think much of it had to do with incompetence as opposed to um, bad faith. Uh, but again, when you have a very polarizing secretary general um, like Almagro, uh, it's not surprising that people uh, really raise questions about the neutrality or the impartiality um, of, of the OAS in that, that kind of situation. One initiative that I think would be important would be to say, let's take the democratic charter. It doesn't really spell out what we do when there is a, an infraction or a violation of democratic rights and norms. Maybe what we need is not to reopen the charter because if we were to do that, we wouldn't get to the consensus that, that was achieved in 2001. The current situation is a different one. Um, but there are things that are missing. Uh, for example, any mention of social media. And it may be that what we could do is create a guiding document, an interpretive document that begins to develop a kind of a jurisprudence around the way in which the charter has been used. I mean, we should start there, right? We should start by assessing what's happened where the charter has been invoked or used or, or mentioned in the past, Honduras, Venezuela, Nicaragua, et cetera. Take a look at that, make, make an honest assessment of what's worked and what hasn't, and then come up with a guiding document that helps us in the future to look forward to democratic crises and how the international community is gonna engage with those um, going forward. Thanks so much. I think, I think okay. uh, um, Gerardo had a question. Yes, 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 yes. I was about to, to ask him if he wants to come up on the screen. And please, the audience, send the questions to the question and answer section. Otherwise, I cannot see them uh, because we have so many greetings and congratulations and uh, good wishes for, for Max. So, Gerardo, would you like to come on the screen and? Yeah, I'm, I'm here. I don't know if, uh, yeah. I mean, I can oh, see yes, now I can see you. How are you? Yeah, thank puedes you very much puedes hacer, for hacer, puedes hacer la pregunta en español porque cada uno habla en el idioma que, que le resulta que corresponde. Sí, eh, bueno, escribí la, la pregunta en inglés y hay una frase por ahí que no sé cómo se ve. Bueno, creo que sí se podría decir en español también. No, o sea, eh, pregunto, bueno, en primer lugar, felicitarte, Max. Eh, muy cálidamente por, por este premio tan merecido, ¿no? Y me encantó tu plática, eh, pero hay un detalle, pues, que, que quisiera yo plantear, que me parece así una especie de elefante en el cuarto de toda la discusión sobre democratización en América Latina, sobre todo, y que es, pues, la presencia del Estado de los Estados Unidos, ¿no? O sea, que en muchas ocasiones, cuando no está de acuerdo con algunas políticas de gobiernos, pues se dedica a molestar a esos gobiernos al grado de que, lejos de promover la democratización, al contrario, ¿no? O sea, promueve que eh, los gobiernos se hagan más iliberales o de plano autoritarios, ¿no? Y planteaba en la pregunta, pues, eh, que por lo menos desde la época de Obama, creo que ese ha sido un caso, eh, eh, o sea, que Venezuela ha sido un caso, y el caso cubano, pues, tiene más de seis décadas, ¿no? En que, eh, o sea, ha sido hostigado completamente, aislado, boicoteado por Estados Unidos, y no sé si, si pudieras comentar, pues, sobre eh, este papel tan abrumador, que me parece a mí, ¿no?, De, del Estado estadounidense, eh, y cómo impacta el proceso de, de democratización. Thanks, Gerardo. This this was, this is a great question, and and it would be a, you know a topic uh, for a whole course, right? I mean, it's a it's a huge huge topic, and in fact, there are many courses offered on precisely this on, on sort of the U.S. role. So, just in a in a nutshell, um, I think what I would say is, of course, the United States has a long history of of um, intervention in Latin American politics goes back to the Monroe Doctrine, goes back to um, the, the, the last century. 
Um, and, and in the 20th century, um, that history of filibustering, um, inter intervening gunboat diplomacy and so forth um, continued uh, after the Second World War um, with the sort of um, anti-communist scare in the United States, the, the, uh, the, in the creation of the CIA, the CIA's involvement um, in, in the um, invasion of, of Guatemala, which clearly um, it was a momentous event in the region's history that, that, that contributed directly um, to the perception of many um, uh, people in Latin America that there was no possibility of, of reform of, in, along the lines that uh, Arevalo and Arbenz uh, represented, uh, and that the only way to achieve any kind of uh, social justice and democracy was by taking up arms. And, that, uh, and, and then we had the Cuban Revolution and the, and the tremendous um, fear that that created among elites across uh, the, the Western Hemisphere, and um, the enthusiasm it generated among uh, I idealistic um, uh, young people, trade unionists, um, peasants, and so forth, who, who began a, a process that we saw a whole cycle of, of, of revolutionary um, activism uh, throughout the region. And, and I think that really kind of culminates uh, in Central America uh, in the, in the 19, 1980s. Uh, I think that that cycle has, has closed. I mean, there are still elements of armed, um, of armed uh, left uh, in, in Colombia, uh, and, and Peru, uh, 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 but but really the idea of revolution is kind of no, no longer uh, on the table. And and at the same time that this process has has occurred, what I see happening in the United States is a shift from a kind of um, the view uh, that uh, anti-communism trumped the defense of democracy, in spite of the fact that, for example, the OAS Charter upholds representative democracy and. And the, and the vision of the hemisphere is as a, a democratic hemisphere. Nonetheless, um, you know, Henry Kissinger was in the General Assembly of the OAS in 1976 in Chile and met with and celebrated Pinochet. And so, you know, at that point, the United States was clearly on the side of intervention and of, um, of stifling a change uh, that, that uh, even change expressed through, through democratic means as in, in, in the case of, of Chile. I think Central America, I think the, the 1980s are the key moment in which, in some sense, everyone fighting in Central America, whether it was the left, the right, the church, the military, the United States, they were all fighting for one thing or another. None of them was fighting for democracy, but that's ultimately what they got, right? At the end of that struggle, uh, what emerged was, uh, in some sense, an, a, a kind of an understanding um, that that armed struggle was not going to bring about um, the, the change that was desired. And, and in, in terms of US foreign policy, this is, of course, the moment where suddenly democracy becomes a centerpiece of foreign policy. And Clinton takes that up and uses it in his attempt to overthrow um, the regime in Haiti. And so we see a very strong expression of, again, democracy as, as a goal of the US, uh, but, 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 but implemented by means of, of, of military uh, force. And, and also at that time, the United States and other creditor governments and international financial institutions promote neoliberalism. And this is where we get that, that consensus, which I'm really trying to challenge in this, in this talk, this idea that markets and democracy go together. And we just have to promote free markets and we have to support democracy. And that will produce the same effects in the region uh, as uh, we imagine uh, has occurred in the developed parts of the, of, of, of the hemisphere. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's, that's the illusion that, that I'm really hoping to challenge. Today, if you think about it, I mean, the, the, the radicalism of the governments of Morales and Chavez and Correa far exceeds in some respects Arevalo and Arbenz and the kind of left that was, on, that was, that was emerging in the 1940s and 50s. And so, it's, and, and the United States has been really unable to do much about it. So, so I think that there's, Latin America has far more autonomy far more capacity to set its own agenda today in relation to the United States than it ever has in the past. Uh, and I think that's a good thing. And I think that's what part of why we're seeing democratic experimentation, including experiments that go wrong, including experiments that fail. But I, 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 I think that, that what that means is that at this moment, um, we now have a situation 
in which the region itself is pol polarized heavily along these issues. And of course, Trump gets elected. And I think that's a, that's a, a game changer in the sense that no longer is the United States seen by anybody, right, as a kind of a, a, a persuasive model of what democracy should be about. That's that the, and, and no longer is the United States seen as a reliable ally in the defense of democracy. You see that very clearly in the way in which the Europeans are treating the United States. And I think that it's appropriate for us in the Western Hemisphere also to operate when our countries come together in the context of things like the Summit of the Americas, operate on the assumption that we could very well have a, the Republicans win in the midterm elections and Trump return in the future or something like Trump, which uh, I think in, is, is, is very, very damaging, um, particularly to the idea that, that the United States has a leadership role uh, in terms of promoting democracy. That being the case, is it not incumbent upon all of the rest of us, uh, whether uh, in the United States or Canada or Latin America, Central America or the Caribbean, to try to work together around building a democratic consensus that isn't hitched to the wagon of the United States and its particular conception of liberal democracy. Thank you, Max. Well, we have a question here. Tenemos una pregunta en el chat de alguien que no me escuchó, que le pedí que por favor pongan las preguntas en el question and answers, pero acá te la leo, te la leo. Aplaudo a Max por su exposición, pero me gustaría preguntarle cómo superar desde la academia estas visiones maniqueas de populismo, autoritarismo, o que tienden a consolidarse como referentes. Yeah. Well, th thanks for that, that question, Alejandro. Um, I think it's a, a really important uh, question. And I think yeah, you're right to put it in this sort of, uh, this really Manichaean terms. I worry um, that there is so much hand-wringing about populism and its threat to liberal democracy that we're missing the fact that our democracies are in trouble. That, that our, our, democ and, and our, our democracy, we have to demonstrate if we want democracy to survive, and by the way, this is a point that was made recently to me by Almagro, and I think he's right. You know, democracies have to be able to show that they work, right? You think about the problems that we face in the region in terms of corruption and violence. If democracies can't solve these problems, people, it's not that people are going to turn against them necessarily. And again, as I said, I don't think populists are always anti-democratic. Sometimes they, they can undermine democratic institutions, but, but they're often an expression of the, of the popular will as well. <clears throat> but we, we, we have to be able to demonstrate that democracies work, right? That's as big a challenge. I, I worry as much about the fact that if Trump gets reelected, not only will that undermine democracy in the United States, it sets back global efforts around climate change, which we can't afford. We need to address climate change. We need to address violence, inequality, corruption, pandemics. Democracies have to be efficacious. They have to be functional. And so I think that the focus of our attention, if we're really concerned about democracy, let's prove to people democracies matter. If you look at the polls from Latino Barometer, you don't see people turning against democracy. What you see is clear evidence that people are increasingly, particularly young people, increasingly indifferent to democracy. My worry isn't that democracy is going to be derailed. My worry is that it'll come to be seen as irrelevant in the face of the kinds of problems that we, we're, we're dealing with in the world. Democracies just don't, don't matter. That to me, that's what keeps me up at night, much more than populist authoritarianism, which isn't to say that, I, you know, that, that there aren't serious problems with the sort of spread of you know, authoritarian populist leaders and so forth, but they reflect something much deeper and much more problematic. And we have to think about how we create more constructive alternatives. I'd like to see our social scientists direct more attention to those problems, uh, perhaps and a little bit less to this sort of defensive democracy is a recession, authoritarianism is spreading. How do we stop this? How do we restore liberal democracy? I think that framing uh, is, is unfortunate. Gracias, Max. Bueno, hay una pregunta más eh, de John Beasley Murray. Eh, Max, I don't, I, know if you, uh, I don't know if you want to ask the question yourself or. Go ahead, John. Go ahead, go ahead, John. 
No, okay, I, I read it. I read it and then you can exchange some, I don't know, there is some delay to open the, the microphones. Okay, Max, many congrats on the prize and thanks for the talk. For me, your most interesting points came near the end in your acknowledgement that citizenship is necessarily contested and exclusionary. And your suggestion that democracy may be inherently expensive in a manner reminiscent of what is now seen in terms of settled colonialism. I wonder if you could say more about these two tendencies, citizenship as exclusion, democracy as a rationale for colonial expansion. Yeah, thanks for that question, John. I, I'm, I'm not sure I have a whole lot to add. I mean, I sort of surprised myself at landing there in the talk. I wanted to sort of tie together the uh, the land acknowledgement and and <laughs> make it meaningful, and um, and I wanted to um, reflect a little bit on uh, how we know that historically um, citizenship. We think about ancient Greece uh, excluded women and slaves, um, and and we think about the ways in which citizenship today is denied to um, migrants. Um, we, we, when, and, and we also, I think, need to reflect on our relationship, with, our broken relationship with nature uh, and how um, <clears throat> we are so uh, challenged uh, as, uh, if, if you think about democracy as a system that, that, that sort of um, allows the public to deliberate uh, and reach decisions on, on, on how to act, um, it, it's, it's, it's anthro, anthropocentric, right? That is, it's always going to be a response to the will of the people. And that tends to be the people now in whatever community we live in, it's not future generations. We have a huge challenge in terms of thinking about what our duties are to future generations and ensuring that our democracies are built in such a way that we can accommodate the needs of, of future generations. Uh, likewise, we have enormous difficulties in our relationship with First Nations. Uh, and, and I would say that, our, that, I mentioned a minute ago, the importance of diplomacy. You know, it, it may be that what we need to do is to say, for those of us who are, 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 are very much participants in the form of life uh, in, in which democracy is constituted through elections and parties and so forth, that perhaps our relationship to those who prefer autonomy and self-determination should be a diplomatic one where we allow for that autonomy. We've seen Bolivia going down the path of encouraging, allowing for autonomy or for, or for something more like municipal um, autonomy or exodus, that is separation or some kind of cohabitation. Canadians know all about those kinds of conversations. And so I think that our view of citizenship, if we really intend it to be inclusive, if we really in intend it to be meaningful empowerment of the people, we have to be open to the possibility that citizenship itself, because it, it always, you know, citizenship means if there are citizens, they're non-citizens. There's always a boundary. There's always something that's, ex that's excluded. We have to think about that, our relationship to that which is left out. And how do we incorporate that into politics? But that's a huge question. As I said, it's, <laughs> it's, for, another, it's for another talk. I'd like, to, I'd like to work more on this and uh, welcome uh, suggestions on how to do so. Ah, yes, I suppose. <laughs> Okay, so we are about to finish. I'm not sure if we have questions from uh, the Facebook page of Amesip. Uh, Grace has a hand up. Okay. No, no, we don't so have. We have, so Grace, we have one, one minute. Uh, tenemos Grace, no? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Grace. Oh, no, I just uh, want to congratulate that and uh, add uh, the additional um, comment that I wanted to make is that uh, I think the, the way forward is really helping the region through either the organization of the American states or any other organization. I mean, ideally, we should work together also with CELAC and, and any other organization that should engage in democracy. I mean, regarding the comments, the late comments uh, made by Gerardo and also Gerardo Munch about uh, setting pathways of democracy, especially I, I want to say that uh, Max really contributed a lot in our last book about considering 
the horizontal dimensions of democracy that uh, are usually overlooked. So thank you for everything. Thank you for your wonderful talk, Max, and uh, um, looking forward for our book. Yes, thanks, Grace. Okay, so they are telling me that we need to finish this wonderful session. Uh, we have more questions. I think that Jesus and I had questions and other colleagues, but unfortunately, we had to end this uh, virtual um, streaming. And Max, I really want to congratulate you. And it's, it's an honor that you had accepted. And as I said at the beginning, Guillermo will be very, very happy. And I have some topics for another seminar. And um, we should talk about outsiders of power that are you know, polarizing democracy. And I want to give Jesus the last word so he can close the session and uh, you know, make a commitment so we have another session with you. Eh, muchas gracias, Gaby. Bueno, excelente, eh, Max. Siempre uno queda pensando en muchas cosas y, y algunos se adelantan con las preguntas y otras preguntas se quedan en el tintero. Pero felizmente que somos tus amigos, así es que la podemos mandarte luego. Quisiera destacar un poco que eh, han, han, hemos tenido interesantes preguntas de diversos colegas, destacados colegas, pero otros han mandado saludos y mencionar sus nombres eh, y de diversos países. María Cecilia Alegre de Argentina, también tenemos a José Antonio Carrera de, de México, María Paz Salas de Bolivia, eh, también de Perú, eh, por acá lo perdí al colega. Bueno, entonces hemos tenido saludos de diversos países de América Latina y eh, el Facebook de AMESIP ha transmitido en directo esta eh, brillante conferencia, así es que pues eh, esto es eh, una conmemoración, pero a la vez una celebración y gracias Max por um, eh, acompañarnos y seguir con nosotros uh, a través de los desarrollos en tus ideas y del próximo libro que esperamos presentarlo eh, si fuera posible en México, ¿eh? hacemos una adelantamos una invitación para presentarlo gracias. en México muchas gracias Max, muchas gracias Gaby muchas gracias Laza, Milagros gracias Pereira para hacer posible todo esto muchas gracias a todos gracias a gracias. todos los que participaron gracias, gracias, eh. gracias, gracias a todos okay. hasta la próxima